And the more you think of your life as that journey, that's the really the joy of, of being in recovery from any kind of addiction disorder. The more you see your life as a long, sustained, exploratory journey, the more you're going to be able to look out for new experiences and look out for new situations, experience new types of joy or connectedness with others. Food Addiction is a podcast which explores the disease of food addiction and presents the solution. We interview professionals and counselors who specialize in the disease of food addiction, and we interview individuals who have successfully recovered from food addiction and discuss how they did it. Esther Helga Goodmans dotier was motivated to change careers after she recovered from food addiction by opening a food addiction treatment center and the INFACT School, the world's first and only sugar and food addiction counseling training, which offers a recognized certification. Check out the website for more information on obtaining this certification, as well as proven recovery programs at infactschool.com. Listen to these episodes as we discuss the problem and the solution around food addiction. I'm Susan Branscombe. I am a recovered food addict and the host of this In Fact School podcast, Food Addiction, the Problem and the Solution. On our podcast today, we welcome Dr. Paul Early as a guest. Welcome, Dr. Early. Great to be here with you, Susan. Yeah, I can't wait to dive in here. What I usually do is introduce you with your bio and then I start uh, with questions. I've got a lot of questions for you. We have a lot to cover uh, around your book and and Attic Brain Recovery Mind Training. So uh, this is going to be a great episode. Dr. Paul Early is an addiction medicine physician who treats all types of addicted diseases. He has over 30 years of experience in the treatment of addiction with a specialty in the assessment and treatment of addiction in healthcare professionals. At his consulting firm, Early Consultancy, he provides training, addiction treatment, They have a special expertise in the treatment of healthcare professionals from evaluation, treatment issues, and return to work issues. He is past president of the American Society of Addiction Medicine, the organization of U.S. physicians dedicated to the treatment of addiction disorders. He is past president of the Federation of State Physician Health Programs that oversees PHPs in the U.S. and Canada. Dr. Early also works with patients already in recovery, providing long-term therapy for those who suffer from addiction. He trains therapists in addiction treatment and the neurobiology of psychotherapy. In his travels, he has provided addiction training in the U.S. and in several other countries. Recovery Mind Training is a treatment system, abbreviated RMT, based on the concept that addiction recovery is a learned skill that can be taught, quantified, and measured. RMT incorporates and unifies multiple treatment techniques into a cohesive patient-centric system. And I read your book, Recovery Mind Training, A Neuroscientific Approach to Treating Addiction. It was excellent and recommended highly. Um, And we'll get into more detail of your addict brain and recovery mind training model, uh, but I really love the book. Um, Very thorough account of addict brain, the neuroscience of brain and addiction, various parts of the brain, recovery mind training, and how to recover. Um, You tend to focus more on alcohol and drugs. Um, Sometimes it sounds like maybe behavioral addictions. I know you know that food and sugar and highly processed foods are addictive, as I understand. Yes, indeed. Yeah, they are. Uh, One of the endorsements I wanted to read came from Dr. Mark Gold, whose name comes up a lot around uh, addiction. He says, uh, Paul has done an outstanding job in refining recovery mind training, making it more treatment friendly and focused on long-term outcomes. When so many addiction specialists concentrate on detoxification and short-term results, Dr. Early reminds everyone that treatment and recovery both require hard work and commitment to remedy addict brain and the disease of addiction. So you say addict brain um, exaggerates the maladaptive characteristics of individual's personality toward its own ends. And recovery mind training then is a compendium of skills that unwind and repairs the damages to the individual as his or her family, social network, um, uh, all caused uh, by the addict brain with the uh, addict. So let's understand a little bit more about about uh, your work, uh, your platform, your approach, um, 
sounds like you train other professionals in RMT and help their patients. Correct. Yep. So, yeah, I'll let you take it from there to explain it. Okay. Well, so uh, wonderful introduction. Thank you, Susan. It's really great Welcome. to be with you. And it's, I'm, I'm amazed how well you've synthesized a lot that's in the book into a very short period of time. So great. Well, just wait. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> the notion of that's really pushed forward in the book is that the brain, when certain situations occur, um, has no ability to figure out a cogent or coherent path through it. And so instead, what happens is whether it's food uh, in certain individuals or alcohol in certain individuals or drugs in certain individuals, um, or even gambling or sexual compulsivity, um, if in some people it causes a rethinking of how the uh, of how the person views not only the substance, the behaviors, but also the world around them, mm-hmm. it's a wholesale reengineering of how the priorities, the goals of the individual. Um, and the concept is if you have all that reorganization of the goals and ways of looking at the world, the treatment then has to be very comprehensive in, in essence, resetting that individual to see the world or believe the world or to understand the world and the, what's happening around them in a different way. Mm -hmm. So that's how we came up with the two notions of addict brain, which is how it becomes disturbed. And it's important for people to understand it's more than just an attachment to, say, a substance or a food. Right, right. And then the recovery from that. Yeah, I'm going to get into some of the quotes you have in the book, uh, set you up to kind of explain some of these things, because it is insidious. Uh, I I didn't realize it. I, I have one. I have an addict brain. But, but some of the things that go on that completely fool us into thinking that things are a certain way and they are not. Um, and you say in the book, addiction is a devastating brain disease affecting over 23 million individuals, including their loved ones, in the U.S. alone. And you cite a statistic, I've heard this one before, it, that 10% of the population, I, I suppose around the world, but in the U.S. are addiction prone, right? Correct. Yeah. And that's um, true around the world, as you said, as well. We just have the data a little more in the United States that I could grab mm-hmm. onto. Many of the guests I've host, food addicts, of course, and then professionals like you, have recovered from food addiction or some other addictions, and they've used 12-step programs, treatment centers, uh, Susan Pierce Thompson, Bright Line Eating. There are all these different ways to recover, um, and yours is really more of a an in-depth, comprehensive approach that does integrate the 12-step recovery model, right? Correct. Yeah. The, the most common, commonly used and the, the model that has the most long-term research about efficacy is are the 12-step recovery programs. So it seems natural to go with what not only seems to work, but also research validates. Mm-hmm. You know, when we say in food addiction, we're not talking about, at least I've never been addicted to carrots, uh, we're, we're talking about being addicted to sugar, highly processed foods, that sugar-fat carb combination of cookies and cakes. And, and uh, Dr. Lustig in our episode said that sugar is chemically the same as alcohol. So it would then follow that we can get addicted to sugar in the same way we can get addicted to alcohol. And absolutely true. The, the issue there is that we evolved through decades, through millennia, um, to be able to be very efficient at finding foods which would sustain us. And when we would come across um, high, more highly refined sugar, it would send a different signal to the brain than less, um, than less, highly, than, than less highly caloric foods. So the sugar and the fat, in essence, was a, the very thing that set us up to succeed as a species Mm-hmm. is the same circuit that really subtends or drives the addiction process. It's almost primitive, is, I think, is what I'm hearing very, you saying. It's a very yeah. primitive desire. Yeah. And we'll talk about the pleasure center of the brain, and the reward center, and how that, how that comes into play. But let's dive into the addict brain. This is fascinating to me. Um, you define the addict brain as uh, the sum of all brain responses, maladaptive associations, and most importantly, 
learning that occurs once an individual develops an addiction, uh, once established, addict brain runs autonomously within the brain focused on its own survival. Uh, describe the addict brain. You, you say that it hijacks our brain. What's, what's going on here? So different parts of the brain have different um, intensities of effect. And one of the most intense areas of the brain is this mesolimbic reward system. And it, and it, it is wired in for every very primitive response, whether it's child rearing, whether it's safety, uh, finding safety, whether it's finding caloric foods to survive. And one can then say the very thing that causes it to evolve that I said earlier is it also winds up creating signals throughout the brain to say, this is important, pay attention here, and all unconsciously. So the minute we were foraging for berries when we were hunter-gatherers and we you know, came across a patch of you know, very sweet uh, berries, the brain then says, I need to learn how to find this place again next spring. I need to figure out how to get back here at the right time of year. All that kind of training is all automatic and is all part of our evolution. So therefore, as a, when we in our current society, when there's an excess of high caloric foods, um, we don't have to do that foraging, but the brain still responds the same way. It still responds so the it same way. It says, right. wow, this is important. Mm -hmm. And we don't understand why in some people it's, it seems to be more what's called a more salient signal, a more important signal. But it is in some people and it isn't in others, just like alcohol becomes important in some people and not others. Right. Yeah. It's just, a, it's an addiction prone response is exactly. what I understand from your book. Yeah. I love your comparison of the addict brain to a computer virus. That, that to me just made all the sense in the world that you say it's an entity unto itself. It runs with the absolute goal of getting the person addicted and keeping him addicted. The addict brain is out to sabotage any recovery efforts and keep the person addicted. And right. in the case and of food addicts, uh, any efforts to become abstinent from sugar and food and highly processed foods, you know, it's just like this addict brain is operating kind of behind the scenes and we don't recognize it, right? Right. And, and what it does is it, you know, if someone says, gee, th this isn't a good idea to you when you're in the middle of any kind of addiction disorder or food disorder, you tend to downplay that because this part of the brain is, the signal is so much more important than someone coming up saying, are you sure you should be doing this? Or this isn't good for you. And what happens in the brain is it says, okay, I'll listen to this, but move on. <laughs> because that signal is more powerful in some people. The more powerful that signal is, the more powerful we learn how to replicate it, and more powerfully we learn how to ignore the data that says, this is not where I should be heading. Yeah. I like that. I mean, from my own personal experience, I've, I've said that I'm a recovered food addict. I can look back at pictures where I weighed 203 pounds and say, I didn't look that bad. Now I can look at it and say, yeah, I did. I did look that bad, you know, right. and we rationalize, we deny. Our families are worried about us. We are not fitting into our clothes. We can't stop eating once we start. That's, that's food addiction. Yeah. And uh, we live in denial, and it's really connected to this addict brain that's that's uh, operating w in, without our awareness. Yeah, and without our awareness, and more importantly, it, it's it's it it creates a uh, importance that pushes away data that is going to um, get in the way of its survival, if you will. So, if you think mm -hmm. about that's that's the whole that's where the computer virus comes in. It's mm -hmm. operating in the background you can't quite see it and in fact it's hiding itself from you and your thinking so that when you say to someone gee you really have to deal with your compulsive behavior around food or alcohol or drugs you kind of say what's wrong with that person right <laughs> it's this immediate turn you know you it doesn't make sense no. and that's therein lies the difficulty with even beginning the journey Mm -hmm. And with food addicts, we diet and we think, okay, I just haven't found the, the right diet. And I dieted for 43 years, ultimately failing every time. I was great at losing weight, but I'd go back to food. And again, the addict brain was in force. And 
you say the central concept of the addict brain is that once addicted, an individual develops a second unconscious series of brain thoughts and actions that attack every aspect of the person's being. Yeah. Uh, unforeseen force running ripshod through their lives. It's just, it's incredible, this this whole thing. And to recognize it is really a big part of the battle. Yeah, I, I, you said that very well. Recognizing it, the moment that people have that kind of aha experience to say, oh man, this is this was really killing me. Not only does it helpful for them, but they often tell other people, the other people say, well, yeah, I saw that all the time. <laughs> Why couldn't you see that? Well, the reason you couldn't see it was the same reason you can't see a computer virus. Its whole right. intent is to run something without being seen. Right, yeah. And for those of us who are addicted, you know, we begin to use these things like food, in our case, uh, alcohol. I'm a recovered alcoholic. Uh, we use them to manage our emotions, manage anxiety and problems in our lives. And then it becomes addictive. It no, more, it's no longer are you using it uh, for pleasure. You're using it because you have to. That's what goes on in the brain. And it's important to say this, that th this is not our fault. You say that addicts um, are not weak-willed, that we're not immoral. There's a lot of shame that goes into addiction, but it's the addict brain that's working. Um, this, is, this is not our fault. When you take a look at addiction among the population, it's the, the single largest driver for addiction. We have less data around food addiction, but certainly around alcohol and drugs. The single biggest driver is genetics, and that there, there's something that we that tends to run in certain families, and then certain triggers occur that make it happen. <clears throat> and sure, we do things which are terrible, um, but the more we can find forgiveness the f of ourselves, the faster we can move into into mm -hmm. really a healthy life. Right, and rejecting the shame that others uh, put us through, and. My father was a, an alcoholic and a food addict, so I inherited the tendency. Uh, but as we get into recovery, we learn that we can say, hey, my dad had it, so I had it, and it's his fault. No, you can't do that. You've got, you've got to go through the recovery process of like taking responsibility, right? Putting blame on other people doesn't net you anything. You know, it's right. all, it it's all has to be, unfortunately, your personal journey. And sometimes it's a very difficult journey. But for the all of the people that I've treated and my, myself and my own recovery, um, the journey is well worth it. But yeah. along the way, it's pretty painful. Yeah, it is painful and it's a journey and it is worth it. And we'll talk about negative consequences before we get into your recovery mind training. Um, what would you say to a person who is, say, you know, male or female, 100 pounds overweight, weighing more than they really should, their maintenance weight or their ideal healthy weight. Um, they say, for, for example, I don't have an addiction. I'm eating out of emotional stress, you know, work, kids, husband, my life is stressful. That's why I eat. What would you, what would you say to that person? Certainly you're looking at the short-term triggers there, if you will. You're saying I eat because dot, dot, dot. Um, and the reality is, is that <clears throat> people, there is, those tend to be triggers for the process, but it's not the core difficulty. And as long as you say, I eat because of X, um, those things will continue to create ongoing problems. You have to take the ownership of the process of change within yourself, which takes time um, yep. and is a gradual um, acceleration of ability to take the responsibility it's not like an overnight thing but once you get to that place um you have you can find the tools to get better and to say the next time that emotional upset occurs i have to use better tools mm -hmm. along the way rather than using <coughs> my addiction to kind of somehow hide uh, right. or, or get better uh, temporarily yeah i mean we we've said in um 12 step uh, recovery often it said try some controlled drinking try to drink just one drink you might be able to do it one or two days try to eat just one or two m&ms you know or one cookie um, i couldn't do it as a food addict i couldn't stop and uh, so i would say to her or him you know can you stop once you start you know and that's that's kind of like you start getting into the definition of food addiction Right. And that's, that's a, a really good point, Susan, is that 
that once you're exposed to that trigger, whether it's the high fat or caloric content of a food or the alcohol or whatever, um, you, you people can actually, once you have the kind of insight that you can begin to develop, deepen that insight by seeing what happens. Um, and uh, so that type of self-exploration is important. And then introducing the solution, which is really acknowledging that this is something that's going on in an unconscious level inside of my head. And what can I do to unwind that? Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, as, as you know, that process of that vulnerability exists in individuals for the rest of their lives, much as if someone had um, high blood pressure. Um, right. But, and even if they get on medicine, they still have the problem of high blood pressure. It's a chronic condition. Right. But good news is for this chronic condition is that the remission from the problem is better than the illness by far. Mm -hmm. So it's worth yeah, the it journey, is. but along the way, it's hard yeah. to get there sometimes. Yeah. I think what you're saying is what, what I've learned in my recovery is that the addiction is still there within me. Uh, that it, that it doesn't go away. It's not like my appendix was bothering me. Take it out; it's gone. No more problems. Addiction is a chronic disease, and it's always living within me. Even though I do recovery activities every day to to not start, so I use a program of recovery versus food and alcohol to deal with things. So, yeah, and and it's said it's a progressive disease, right? It it is. Right. And I always say it's a bad news, good news story. The bad news is it's chronic. The good news is, is that the remission from the illness um, for most of my patients has been happier, more contented than before they got sick. So, yeah. you know, there's some really upsides for this going through this darkness and having the problem is um, once you develop remission, there's a freedom that one feels. There's mm -hmm. a set free. There's a, there's a way of handling for instance, those emotions that you thought caused the eating right. um, that's more healthy and more life-sustaining. And the result is people leave, live happier lives. Um, yes, the they do indeed. Yeah, they do indeed. Uh, I'll kind of wrap up on the addict brain thing. We can come back to it if we want. But you say you cannot outthink addict brain, but you can recognize its agenda and its goal. So it's important that a patient, once he's surrendered, this is my words, uh, once he's surrendered to that he there is an addict brain and that this this addiction he has, he's powerless over, uh, that he has to understand the addict brain as being separate and distinct, almost having a life of its own or being like a separate person, right? Right. <clears throat> that, you know, it's it's not quite a separate person, but but as I point out in the book, and as you're pointing out is very nicely, is that the more you kind of figure out how to distance yourself from it and even maybe even talk to it, wait a minute, what are you trying to get, what are you trying to make me do here? You know, if you mm -hmm. begin to kind of see it as some little evil imp inside your head, then you can say, look, I'm not going to listen to you today. I'm going to figure right. out how to do these skills to manage recovery. <clears throat> and unless you take that recognition the addict brain will find ways of unconsciously undoing your recovery. And the mm -hmm. more you kind of see it as distinct from yourself, the more you can differentiate the who I am from what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've talked on this podcast in various episodes that um, once we start, whether it's a drug or food, say sugar, uh, we we ingest it and it's pleasurable. And so we go back and we want more and it's pleasurable. At the beginning, it is that way. Mm -hmm. But then at some point, the addict becomes addicted. And then part of not wanting to stop can be withdrawal, that there is our negative consequences of withdrawal. I mean, I went through, you know, uh, the toxicity release of sugar and alcohol when I, when I got sober and it lasts... Um, you know, it lasted about a three weeks or a month, but I got through it, the cravings and everything. And you talk about that in the, in the book, but talk about withdrawal as it relates to addiction. Well, that's a, another great question, Susan. So the first thing that people should understand is what you pointed out is that withdrawal is just withdrawal. It's not the recovery process. It's what you go through to get to the next phase. Yeah. And unfortunately we're living in a culture today where um, <clears throat> the concept of caring for addiction sometimes 
uh, is just deal with the withdrawal, get them through the withdrawal. And then some, this sophomoric idea that people are going to say, Oh, I'm all better now and be able to actually sustain their, their health. And that Mm -hmm. is, it's very sophomoric that the withdrawal is unfortunately just a phase one goes through to get to the real work, frankly, the real work right. of figuring that we talk about in, in the, um, in the steps towards remission, mm-hmm. um, in, in recovery mind training. And <clears throat> so the, um, the withdrawal is just that and different. Some people have terrible withdrawal. Some people have less withdrawal, but by the way, that's not correlated with whether you're going to do well, it just seems to be one of those things. Some people mm-hmm. have terrible sugar withdrawal, and it's oh yeah, it's, it's, it's as it's as bad as alcohol withdrawal or some other things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just knowing that it's temporary. Oh it, yeah, that wasn't so bad. Um, but whatever phase it is, it, yeah. it is what it is. You go through it, and then you're ready to do the heavy lifting, as we say, right? Right. Yeah, there's some heavy lifting. I know that's um, for sure. Uh, but uh, it's almost like uh, once you get through the sugar withdrawal, alcohol withdrawal, um, that you it's almost like that scene in Wizard of Oz, you know, when Dorothy comes, comes uh, she wakes up after the, the hurricane or tornado and, and looks around and everything's in color. It's kind of like that. It was like that for me where mm-hmm. I put everything down and then it's like, wow, I've got some emotions here that I used to shut down with food. I used sure. to shut down with alcohol. And we talk in twelve step recovery speak about the causes and conditions. What were ca- what was causing us to eat? What was causing us to use food as we come a- come out of the physical addiction of it? Right. Right. And the the concept there is there what in using recovery my training is, is is in relapse prevention is there are there are triggers in the environment, um, and then there has to be a specific response you learn. Uh, to those triggers, so that you, so that relapse doesn't occur. Yes, and um, so that's just one of the many things one has to learn um, mm-hmm. going through all that. Right. Yeah. Let's start talking about your model of uh, recovery mind training. There's a lot here, and I want to make sure we hit it all. Uh, I'm going to self reference uh, for the sake of our listeners because there may be people out there that are that are addicted to food and they're trying to figure this out. Um, often when we go into recovery, whether whether it is food or another substance, uh, it is the negative consequences that bring us into recovery. In the case of food recovery, I weighed 203 pounds. I was size 18s in a lot of cases. Uh, I was only five, I'm only 5'2". I had diabetes, high blood pressure. I was essentially slowly killing myself with food. Um, I just knew I could not do another diet, Um, and the addict brain, as I see from your book, had a hold on me, and and I knew it, but but to put a name on it and think of it as a computer virus really helped me. Ultimately, I surrendered. I have a food addiction disease. I couldn't stop once I started. I tried, and and I say, food beat me in a fair fight. (laughs) I cannot do this on my own. It beat me in a fair fight. Okay, I give up. Uh, so I went into com- uh, recovery because I wanted to live. I wanted to live for me and my family. And, and uh, I, I, was, I don't know how I would have died, but something was going to get me. So um, we've talked about, and in 12-step meetings, and I'll, I'll let you talk about your, your model, but in 12-step meetings in, uh, that they say that there is one of the three L's that is going to bring you to recovery, your liver, your lover, or the law in uh, alcohol addiction. And uh, usually it's one or all three, uh, one of them is is going in. So talk about what it's recovery and what it's like, negative consequences, and we'll start talking about recovery skills in your model. Yeah, I, I think that all addiction disorders, because we have no way of uh, of modulating them on their own, just kind of naturally, We've, as a species, we haven't learned that there will always be negative consequences of the addiction. What Recovery Mind Training tried to do was to take the the best of our current psychotherapeutic um, techniques, if you will, and I'm going to throw 12-step recovery into that. It's got a psycho-spiritual element, which is important as well. Take the best of the techniques, create um, measurable 
goals to to get through uh, in attaining those techniques and and also to be able to adapt them to some different individuals. Different individuals may need more of one of the different domains that are in the treatment of, an, uh, of, of addiction using recovery mind training. Um, and so each person's different. It's, you, you can't use a cookie cutter response, but by putting them into a, a compendium and saying here and putting them to six domains, I said, here they are. And, um, with the help of a therapist, with the help of a sponsor in 12-step recovery, with the help of a, a, a treatment program, they can help you um, prioritize and figure out what to do next in this kind of, uh, um, probably not the right metaphor, but smorgasbord of, of different uh, items that, uh, that are available. And again, different people need to have be have more attention paid to different types of skills. I also talked about the fact that in recovery, if if you think about it as a skill deficit, it feels less negative. Um, and you say, you just need to learn some skills so that the illness will not uh, have a recrudescence, won't show up again. And the object is not some vague thing in the future, but rather to attain a set of skills which will sustain your remission from the illness of a chronic illness. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of metaphor that goes through the concept of using skills uh, versus saying, well, you know, you don't know how to handle your emotions. Well, that's really negative. Some mm -hmm. people um, are better at others in handling emotions. And some people are really do okay with handling their emotions, but they have more of them and they're more strong and inside of right. them. So they need to have a better set of skills and manage them, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really fascinating, um, very thorough um, program. Uh, you talk about the behavioral, the cognitive, the emotional, spiritual. You address all of that, and you divide the treatment into categories. The first one is interrupting addiction behaviors. The second one is shifting the brain from addict brain processing to recovery mind thinking and acting. Talk about some of that work that you do. Yeah, one of the concepts... <clears throat> The people that don't understand addiction have is that, um, well, you just need to stop that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's, that's wrong with you. You just need to stop yeah. that. Yeah. But because this is such a strong primitive drive, you literally need to put something in, in the way of the illness occurring. And that often involves external constraints. So in the process of someone that has an alcohol disorder, you remove all the alcohol from the house. If they have a food disorder, you, you decrease access to the highly addictive substances. Maybe you don't do things like go out to restaurants for a while, um, but you figure out how to uh, organize your uh, necessary food consumption into safe bits. You have someone go grocery shopping with you to make sure that you're Attic brain doesn't kind of kick into high gear. So it's that's that first phase is called containment. You need to contain the illness. And to a mm -hmm. large degree, the containment requires external constraints. You need to have someone, something, some way of blocking this primitive drive from taking action. And <clears throat> and and so for some people, for instance, in traditional alcohol and drug treatment is they go to a treatment center where they where they literally can't get access to alcohol and drugs. And then over time, that first domain of containment can be lessened. So for instance, well, one of the things that we use that has great success in the care of healthcare professionals is having them have uh, alcohol and drug screening, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, you might have a, um, if you have a food addiction, you might have a food sponsor that says, let's go over what you ate. Let's review it every day so that that creates an impediment for the illness to creep in and say, just this one time you can do this. Just this one right. time you can buy a, 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 some Oreos. Just this one time you can cook this particular food or bake this particular food. So, <clears throat> so creating external constraint is that, is that first, uh, first domain always has to occur first in the vast, vast majority of people, alcohol, mm -hmm. and drug disorders, and food addiction. That's containment. That's domain A. Right, yeah. And then you have uh, 
basic recovery skills, emotional awareness, and resilience. I love how um, you, you talk about, you know, the accountability. And in the case of food, uh, you know, the program that I work, uh, I am accountable to someone. I tell her what I eat. If I want to make any changes, I need permission, you know. And I always think he's kind of like my uh, my parole officer, but I need to be accountable. That's the kind of critical level food addict I am. I can't have anything beyond what I've said. Right. And, and, that's, and that's containment. That's all domain A. Yeah. In domain B, basically, we think there are three different types of skills to learn. Um, the psychosocial spiritual aspect of 12-step recovery is really um, John Kelly, who's done a lot of the research on Alcoholics Anonymous from Harvard, says um, that AA and NA and, and OA are the closest thing we have in healthcare to a free lunch. And I'm sorry about the lunch metaphor, but you know, it yeah. basically it's saying this this process really works, and it's free, essentially free. I mean, maybe a dollar you put in the in the plate once at a, at a meeting, but that's in today's market that's free essentially. Um, and so that's part of it. The other two skills that we think are important are developing some mindfulness. Um, the Buddhist technology of mindfulness through meditation or just being mindful about your day uh, creates a self-reflective individual that's always thinking about what's happening with them in a non-judgmental way, which is critical. Because the other thing that most people with addiction have done is perfected the art of self-criticism. They can say the meanest things to themselves in their own head, and all of that is a useless Thing. It's not going to change the behavior. It just furthers the downward spiral. Yeah, we we're good at beating ourselves up. That's for sure. Right. Yeah. Sure. Your your third domain. Uh, I love some of the stuff that you said about emotional awareness and resilience. Um, you said that uh, about dealing with emotions because often as addicts we use the substance so that we don't feel emotions, and that's what I did. I didn't want to feel it. Um, and, you know, just identifying emotions correctly. And you even list them out, which I do, because I am so you know, often disconnected from my emotions, happiness, sadness, just to see how I'm feeling, you know. So just developing, you know, being aware of those emotions and, and uh, being able to handle them without trying to shut them down, right? Right. Yeah, emotions, there's a, the way of thinking about it is the, all of the emotional circuitry in the brain is almost a distinct set of <clears throat> neuronal structures and it's operating there all the time and it's creating, yeah. you know, strong feelings. So most people with addiction disorders, not all of them, but most people ha- seem to have a surfeit of strong emotions. It seem to be really difficult for them to handle. Um, and so learning some resilience and sitting with them and not being judgmental of them and not being uh, swept away by them is really a wonderful skill. There's mm-hmm. another subset of people, it tends to be more <sighs> men than women, who actually have difficulties even recognizing their feeling states. And that is a different, the skills there for people with that particular type of mm-hmm. uh, issue um, are very different than the people that learned how to ha- have to learn resilience. Because people with more what we call alexithymia, ability to know or recognize feelings, have to be able to recognize them so they can interact with others and understand what's happening inside their world. Emotions are important to all of us. They, they provide the spice for life, but we have to learn how to be with them, oftentimes without even reacting, just sit with them. And the mm-hmm. skills there talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, when I, first, when I first saw your book, I thought, you know, what you hear in 12-step groups, which is my best thinking got me here, my mind takes over. I really needed to just surrender and release. And I thought, you know, maybe this recovery mind training thing is like just like trying to trick my mind into thinking another way, but it's not. It's very, very thorough. And um, you integrate 12 step recovery, you respect it, and it's part of it. Um, and, you know, um, we have we do have to surrender to the powerlessness of this. We have to recognize the attic brain and what's going on here. Um, yes. There's one there's one woman I I interviewed on this podcast. Um, you know, there's so much selfishness around this that we don't see. And she said that she had to make an amends to her husband by saying she was having an affair with food. Thought that was very interesting. 
you know, to let it go. Yeah. But talk about 12-step as it relates to RMT. We don't understand completely why 12-step recovery is effective, although <clears throat> I will refer people to Dr. Kelly's compendium in what's called the Cochrane Reviews, which is the uh, highest regarded um, uh, vetted um, uh, review process. And he and um, uh, Keith Humphreys and uh, uh, Ms. Faree went through a long process of looking at thousands and thousands of papers uh, to be able to say what are the elements that seems to work. And I, I, again, we don't understand it completely and we don't understand how it evolved. It's so funny that such an effective system just kind of evolved organically without scientists coming in saying, we yeah. this and blah, blah, blah. Right. So it's, it's a truly amazing. Uh, and not only did it evolve, but it's also essentially free. So, you know, th that's just really remarkable. But something about learning how to connect with other people, how to develop an understanding of what you've been through, how to take uh, direction for health from a sponsor, um, how to learn how to have a connection because addiction is isolates us from our spiritual beliefs or our sense, whether that spiritual belief is a connection with other humans or a connection with the God of your understanding. Mm -hmm. It disconnects you there as well. So having all of this in one place with a is is profoundly important and helpful for long term remission. Yeah. So that's that's the purpose of that. So you if we teach people how to use the tool, and that's what recovery mind training does. It says we're gonna. This is a tool, but it's a tool that some people find hard to implement. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna teach you how to do it. Right. It is work. You know, it is a lot of work. And um, the twelve step programs I have worked, um, I had to, and I do have a spiritual side. Uh, not everybody believes in God. It can be the program. It can be anything but you make you cite in your book um, a statistic about how there is a connection with people that have a spiritual side that really embrace this higher power as a way to you know I'm powerless uh, this higher power can help me uh, and sustain long-term recovery there's a connection there right absolutely yeah no doubt about it there's one place I wanted to go with you as we Kind of close out here, and that is um, the distinction between uh, eating behaviors, um, eating disorders like anorexia and bulimia, and food addiction. And they're not separate as much. They are connected, but they are different. And in food addiction, we have behaviors where where they're compulsive and addictive even besides the, phys the chemical addiction to food, that, that brain response. Talk about anorexia, bulimia, and food addiction, how they're related, how they're different. Oh, thank you for this a fascinating topic. I actually started my career treating anorexia nervosa and bulimia. Um, and those are two very complicated illnesses. And what happened in the center that I was working is we started treating those two particular illnesses and then moved on to uh, what at the time was called the compulsive overeater, you know, the food addict. Right. Um, and so they're very different in their evolution. There seems to be some uh, some ties for anorexia nervosa to, in some people, to evolving sexuality, and the evolving mm. sexuality is complicated, and that anorexia is is somehow tied into that. Um, there is also interesting data, by the way, about bulimia nervosa. Uh, bulimia as uh, a disorder, people, bulimia tends to evolve for weight control um, or anxiety control and tends to be a little more often in women, although it, it occurs fairly often in men. It's just not as easily diagnosed, actually. Mm -hmm. And then it, it, if it starts off in around weight control, then it winds up being a way of modulating people's feelings, much like a, the food addict. Uh, the binge purge cycle is a way of modulating how getting control over the feeling states, just as the, as the food consumption, the, the binging in a, a food addict uh, is like that as well. 
Also, uh, people that do have bulimia as um, earlier in life, the data is pretty clear that a substantial portion of those people go on to develop alcohol use disorder. So it's mm-hmm. yeah, you know they're very closely tied. And are they genetically determined? Unclear. But I can certainly say some limited research shows that anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa tend to occur in families that have out other substance use disorders as well. Ah, okay. So there, it may have a genetic link, and it may be an expression of the same illness, um, but coming out at a different age time, because anorexia tends to occur younger in life. Bulimia tends to occur a little a little later than that in, in adolescence. And then substance use disorders tend to occur uh, more in people through adolescence and into adulthood. Mm-hmm. So um, I see it, it may be the same, a similar expression of the same neural circuitry. We don't understand it. Um, and uh, I can also tell you, having treated folks with bulimia, with anorexia nervosa especially, if you compared with the inability to see the illness, what we call in the, the, the term in the tr- addiction treatment field is denial. You know, it might sound a little pejorative, but by the way, it's not. The, it's literally the inability to see the problem. People with anorexia nervosa have the thickest and most complex denial of any type of addiction disorder. Oh, wow. Their inability to see themselves as thin, mm. their inability to understand that they're dying. Yeah, um, the inability to recognize their behaviors as abnormal, all of that is so thick in uh, people with anorexia nervosa. Especially, it's just remarkable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and and so it is. It may be an expression of the same type of illness, and may be age somewhat age dependent. And then, if you're an older uh, uh, older adult, say in your late early twenties or on. Um, some people with food addiction tend to uh, develop binge purge cycles as well. So it may yeah. be the same illness. Yeah, I've seen that. And, um, you know, I, I was, uh, I used diuretics and, um, you know, laxatives. That's a bulimic kind of behavior. Yep. Um, insurance companies pay for the treatment of anorexia and bulimia. Uh, we're working on the DSM 5, of course, for food addiction. And I think all of what you said makes it complicated, you know, that there's so much overlap, but differences, age, you know, it's complex with the sexual component of it. Um, And, and so, yeah, it's, uh, it's a very interesting uh, point you made. Um, Well, as we have got some more questions for you and I'm excited to, to ask them as we kind of close out here. I love this, uh, this quote um, from your book. The journey out of addiction is filled with strange new experiences, like a long hike. There may be parts that are flat and uninteresting. At other times, the journey is challenging. Along the way, there will be excitement and beauty. The beauty will come for most people if they consider recovery as a journey of self-discovery. And you say it requires learning, feeling, practicing, the new skill sets of recovery mind training. And I'd like you to comment on that, but really just to kind of wrap up here, I mean, we, we eat for pleasure. We become addicted as food addicts. Um, we don't see it because of the addict brain. We have negative consequences. And if, we're, if we want it, we could get into recovery. And that's where the work starts. So, you know, talk about talk about that that journey. Uh, that it's hard, but it's it's all worth it. That it's beautiful. Yeah, I, some of the beauty comes from recapturing the humanness. Um, it doesn't matter what type of addiction it is. You literally don't. You lose the thing the the very things that make life pleasurable. Connecting with friends, learning how to experience uh, new sensations, new emotions, new connections. All those things get set aside by the illness. The illness pushes those aside because it's it has a singular goal. Mm-hmm. So that hike that we're all on is, um, and the more you see it as there are times, you know, I've been on hikes where I've huffed and puffed the entire way up the hill, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, and you say, well, I do. And you say to yourself, why am I doing this? And then there are other times <laughs> you get to the top and you say, wow, this was worth it. 
Well, that's exactly what one needs to think about uh, with the recovery journey, because it's a journey, and it's a journey that all of us stay on. And the more you think of your life as that journey, that's the really the joy of, of being in recovery from any kind of addiction disorder. The more you see your life as a, a, as a joy, if, um, uh, as a long, sustained, exploratory journey, the more you're going to be able to look out for new experiences and look out for new situations, experience new t- types of joy or connectedness with others. And that's yeah. the upside of, of, of this, this really devastating disease. It is de- devastating, but recovery is just, it's wonderful. And we say that uh, it's a path for, not for people that need it, it's for people that want it. Right. If you want it, it's here. The recovery is here. And, you know, I'm living that life. You know, I, I don't weigh 203 pounds. I'm 70 pounds less. And I can run with my grandkids, play basketball with them and soccer and, and, uh, and, and be healthy. And I don't know how long I'm going to live, but I will hopefully live longer. I've extended my life. But uh, it is all worth it. And it's work. Uh, the recovery part is work. Um, but the surrender to what's really going on you know the truth around this is is where is where the the start of recovery is i think yeah absolutely yeah. yeah well thank you dr early for being my guest today uh it's been great i think esther's going to love this this podcast it was a great book dr early tell us the name of your book again recovery mind training yep it's recovery mind training a comprehensive method of uh of recovery yeah, and it is. It's really, really wonderful, and I can see why it works. But thanks again for being my guest today. It was my pleasure, Susan. Thank you for your time. Thank you. This is the Food Addiction Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the podcast and learned more about this disease. We hope you will rate and write a review on this podcast and share it with others. If you or someone you know is suffering from the disease of food addiction, there is a solution. The various food addiction recovery programs are available and listed on the website, theinfactschool.com. Or if you would like to know more about how to get certified in treating food addiction, the school is accepting applications now for its next training beginning in September 2023. Go to theinfactschool.com. That's I-N-F-A-C-T school.com to learn more. Are you passionate about helping others overcome food addiction? Do you dream of making a real difference in people's lives? Look no further than the Infact School, the first and only program that offers an accredited international professional certification for food addiction professionals. With over 170 hours of engaging and informative online virtual teaching sessions, you'll delve deep into the world of food addiction and gain the knowledge and skills needed to make a lasting impact. Our experienced instructors who are leading experts in the field will guide you through the latest research and evidence-based practices. The Infact School goes beyond theory and equips you with the hands-on skills you need to support individuals on their journey to recovery. You'll gain invaluable experience working directly with clients under the supervision of our faculty. Upon completion of our program, you'll be a certified food addiction professional, ready to make a positive impact in the lives of those struggling with food addiction. Join the Infact School today and be a part of the solution. Together, let's conquer food addiction and build a healthier future for all. Visit our website at www.infactschool.com to learn more and enroll in our professional training program. The journey starts here at the Infact School.